Welcome to episode 53 of the Series About Security podcast for August 21st, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research and Information Insurance and Security, or Sirius at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined again by Keith Watson and Mike Hill. Um, and I have the first story, it's more than one article. Um, it's a few weeks old, but we've been covering other things the last few weeks. So um, I thought we'd talk about this. Um, <clears throat> it's about uh, two uh, encrypted email providers. Uh, Silent Circle was one of them. They provide other encrypted services and a lot of it. Uh, and that's all they, I guess that's all they provided was encrypted email. And both of them uh, shut down, um, claiming that they couldn't essentially do their, do their, pr provide their service under the cloud of the government uh, snooping. And um, Bob of it was the first one to essentially announce that they were, sh they were suspending their service. And the silent circle um, people followed up with that. Um, I think an interesting aspect of this thing is that uh, Edward Snowden used a lot of it as his, in, his encrypted email service of choice. Um, and so I'm guessing they, the, uh, the federal government was very interested in, in them and how they did things and to see if they could, you know, get, get, uh, get information from them and, and all that. Um, so I thought this was very interesting. And one more um, place that also shut down, which wasn't encrypted email, but I guess was due to encrypted email, was the Growth Law um, uh, <coughs> site. Um, they decided that since they couldn't use encrypted email to do their thing, that they were afraid of revealing sources and things like that. Um, and they didn't want to be involved. So I just thought that was interesting and wanted to get your two comments. I think it's interesting in that, the, in the case of the Lava Bit, the founder of the company basically shut down the service, citing that something was going on, but he could not be specific as to what. So most likely he was issued what's called a national security letter. And this is part of the uh, Patriot Act where the government could send a letter to service providers and other, other folks and say, hey, we need ongoing collection of information from you about a particular person or everybody now. <laughs> and, uh, and oh, by the way, this is a gag order, which means you can't even talk about it. Now, in the case of Lobbit, uh, Lauder Levison, I probably butchered his name, and I apologize for that. Uh, mentioned in his announcement that he is asked on multiple occasions to talk about what was going on and was told no in both cases. So they're they're shutting down to kind of avoid on you know compromising the security privacy of their customers. And I think that's you know for a company to to do that that's that's pretty impressive. But I think this company is one that's founded on ideology more than uh, financial concerns, and that's. You know, there are a few of those these days, so that's good to see. And similar case with Brock Law, I think they were relying on a lot of encrypted email to communicate with a lot of the people that are part of that, uh, you know, the law, law service that they're providing there and, and to kind of get that it's insider information. And so they would be at risk uh, using a lot of the encrypted email providers in the U.S. And they wouldn't know it because they'd be those providers will be under gag order not talk about it. So that's some interesting activity there on at least on the service provider side. And so what's interesting on the, the silent circle case is that they indicate that they had not specifically been asked uh, to provide any information on their customers. However, before they were to be asked, they decided to go ahead and, and close that particular service that they have. They do have two, I believe, three other services in which they do not actually hold any data at all, so it would not be possible for them to go and basically collect data on their users. But in the case of their email service, they did actually have that centralized, and so it would have been possible. 
So instead of doing that and doing nothing and trying to wait to decide, they just decided to go ahead and cancel that particular service that they provided. Still remain in business. Yeah, it sounds like they were really kind of torn on what to do. And I think Bob a bit making the decision that they did kind of helped inspire them to follow through on their decision. It sounds like it was a couple tough weeks for them before they decided that. Um, like you said, these types of companies are kind of more based on ideology. It, it's a difficult decision when there's financial risk involved, um, significant financial risk. But these types of companies felt that it went against their core principle and were able to do these things. And in the case of Silent Circle, they have the other services they offer. I think it's Silent Phone, Silent Text, and uh, Silent Eyes that they'll continue to provide. So, uh, you know, the, the most disappointing part is, like you mentioned, the, the gag order. The, you know, we're being asked things that we're not comfortable about, we don't like what's happening, but I can't tell you why. You know, and really they did, I guess they did the most honorable thing they could do. At least that's what we're led to believe is, well, we're shutting, we're, we're shutting down. I can't tell you why we're shutting down, but basically we don't agree with whatever was being asked of us, and we're just going to shut down because that's the only other option that was left to us. Well, and the founder of Blavabit said in one of his, the, his statements in his, um, the message he posted when they announced they were suspending services, his experience has taught me one very important lesson um, throughout congressional, without congressional action or a strong judicial precedent, I would strongly recommend against anyone trusting the private data to a company with physical ties to the United States. And that's, that pretty much means don't trust anyone. <laughs> <laughs> that is somewhat true, so sadly, uh, considering the largest you know, email providers are U.S. companies, even though they operate, you know, overseas. They're still U.S. companies, and and so some of that, most of that data, some of that data at least, is in the U.S. Even if you reside outside of it, so there's always that concern, especially given that the NSA, when it comes to you being not in the U.S., oh, it's fair game. I mean, that's a problem to consider. And so, one interesting thing that was mentioned, and I've not spent a lot of time researching it, was another service based in Switzerland uh, that provided email. Uh, it's not a free email service, but hey, if you want to get privacy and security, you probably want to pay for it. So that might be another um, company to consider. I think it's my collab, K-O-L-A, K-O-L-A-B. I believe mycollab.com is the site. Again, we're not making recommendations, but that was one site mentioned that based in Switzerland, they have Switzerland having a, their you know, fierce self-reliance and, and uh, independence from a lot of uh, other countries and including their uh, you know, absence from the European Union, even though they're smack dab in the middle of Europe. So, <laughs> middle of Europe, so. Uh, that might be one to consider, I don't know, but there are probably some others maybe. Well, there are other ways to encrypt email as well. And I, well I honestly didn't use either of these services, so I don't know what they provided above and beyond, like what S Lime or whatever would provide. So I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what, what is, what was, was better about this essentially. I believe they were web-based email systems, so you didn't have to set up your own email server or use. You can use theirs, similar to like Gmail or mm -hmm. Outlook.com, sort of web-based right. email services, but with encryption. Okay. So, kind of scary news. Uh, interesting in that these companies are changing their position. I think we should also note that that Google, while they're certainly probably collecting information and sending it on to the NSA when asked. They have also sent a letter to the DOJ and, the, and probably the DCI to request that they be allowed to talk a little bit more about these national security letters. I think that will go nowhere, but at least they published the letter that they sent uh, asking for permission to talk about these things. So I don't know if that will actually do anything, but I think it's an interesting tactic. And the founder of Lavabin also said that if the laws change, then he would be willing to resurrect the service. And, and there is an effort underway to change parts of the Patriot Act where 
where it is a very broad definition of what the national security or any intelligence service is allowed to do in terms of collection. And so should that change, then we may see a uh, revival of these companies. In fact, if that does change, I would, I would propose we will see a, a lot more companies spring up to kind of fill the gap here, because now the awareness is out that the NSA is doing this. And of course, it's not really national news here in the U.S. as much as it's national news in Europe, specifically the Germans. They're not like this. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. So. Yeah, it's unlikely anyone will pop up in the meantime, though, with the laws changing. No, so no, no, no. really no guarantee. If anything, they'll, they'll pop up somewhere in a legal jurisdiction where, where they can do this a little more safely. Switzerland was one example. I'm sure there's probably some Caribbean islands that have uh, similar banking laws and privacy laws to Switzerland that may, may also have <laughs> magic email services. Well, then, 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 well, then at least one announcement of somebody who was mentioning that they were going to do something. But, um, Kim.com. Well, of course. May, uh, you know, um, of course. Whatever. He's got a long history. He's so not like him to anyone. I am something. going to, I'm going to do something about it. All right. That. Excellent. And tell him the survey. Now if it actually happens, I don't know. We shall see. He's, he's a lot of talk sometimes. But he did, did replace his previous service or something. So. Okay. All right. Then we'll Let's yep. All right. Uh, I've got the next article. Um, I wanted to bring this one up. We've talked in recent podcasts about the uh, bounty programs that uh, uh, folks like Google and Microsoft and Apple have. We've also mentioned Facebook. Uh, as it turns out, there an article popped up this week about um, a bug that was discovered in Facebook. But in this case, Facebook's not paying the bounty. Um, so, so the details are a Palestinian security researcher had discovered a bug that would allow you to post on someone else's wall without being their friend. And to demonstrate the bug, he posted on the wall of Sarah Gooden, who happens to be like a college friend of Mark Zuckerberg. Um, he then reported to the security research team within Facebook. Facebook responded, uh, because the security research team at Facebook are not friends with Sarah Gooden, when they followed the link that the uh, researcher had sent them, they just got an error page back. So they, they communicated back and forth a little bit, and they said, and basically they said, well, we're not seeing this as an error. And he said, it's because you're not her friend. You need to escalate your privileges and view the page. Well, they just pulled them off, and they, they basically wrote back, this is not a bug. So feeling, I guess, uh, desperate or upset that he was told it wasn't a bug, he, he took the next, I guess, logical action. Maybe, maybe he took it a little too far, but he decided, well, I'll just post a Mark Zuckerberg's timeline. And that's what he did. He, he wrote a letter. It was actually not a, uh, a, you can read the letter in the article we posted. It wasn't a, a malicious letter at all. It was very well phrased. He basically said, dear Mark Zuckerberg, I've discovered this bug. Your security research team is not taking it seriously. Here's a thread of our conversation. I want to make you aware of it. Um, and then they got Facebook's attention. Now, obviously, Facebook responded. But as part of their response, they said, well, we, we thank you for discovering the bug. However, you didn't follow our protocol. Their protocol is you should use test accounts for these types of things. They have a whole you know, series of protocols to follow. And he essentially violated it from step one by posting to Zuckerberg's friends wall. So they said, well, we really appreciate, you know, letting, giving us a heads up, but, you know, no bounty for you. And uh, what's interesting is there's been kind of a backlash on, on social media from this. If you look at, uh, Facebook did post an official response. Um, if you look down at the comments, many people are saying, pay, you know, pay this researcher. He, he did his job. And um, personally, I tend to agree with that. I know he didn't necessarily follow all the steps, but to me this feels like Facebook's upset that they got the egg on their face. And I think that's the wrong approach to take here. I think it's okay to say, you know, we would have paid you a thousand for telling us this, we're gonna give you 500 because you didn't follow this protocol. We don't wanna set a precedent where everyone does this, but we really do appreciate you sharing this with us. It saved us, you know, it allowed us to get this bug corrected before it was used maliciously. And to me that's the danger of what they've said here. They've said, well, if you don't, play exactly by our rules, you know, in the way you report it to us, you're not going to get anything. So I have to wonder, 
from the security researcher's point of view. If he discovers yet another bug, maybe one that's even more powerful than his in Facebook, and he really was looking to get paid, he's now got this uh, backstory of, well, the last time I tried to communicate with Facebook, they said, well, thank you, but no thanks. You know, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> but, you know, uh, you're not going to get any money if you didn't follow this. Or you could just go out to, you know, a competitor, the black hat side of things, and say, hey, how much is this worth to you? How much do you love about it? Well, you may have already gotten several job offers already, so let's not, <laughs> not going to worry too much about him. But other but he's probably going to be reporting uh, stuff, maybe not directly to Facebook this time. I think your point is right. Well. <laughs> So, um, so I thought this was very interesting. So we, we have talked about this a lot in recent weeks. I just wanted to know what, what you guys felt about this. Was this the right approach by Facebook? Um, it's pretty public. I think they should fess up and say, oops, maybe we should go ahead and pay out. Although there's this always a slippery slope argument that if we do it once, it's going to happen again. But they can always say, they can always go. We're going to make an exception in this case, and here are the rules. You know, let's follow them in the future. Um, but I have to say, from personal experience, I have reported a similar security bug to Facebook, and I didn't get paid for it. But I'm not bitter about it, and I, it's certainly not public information. And I believe the bug has been fixed, so I'm not going to worry about it too much. <laughs> but uh, I have interacted with the Facebook security team, and they were. Pleasant and took the report seriously, and, and I gave them enough information about how to recreate it. And I think that was part of the issue too. They just said, you know, there's not enough detail, if because they, he could show what happened, but he could, but he did not demonstrate how he made it happen. So I think that's part. But, of but that's a really good point I'd like to talk about, though. As a researcher, don't you want to hold a little bit back until you get paid? in a sense as well. I mean, don't you want to show enough to demonstrate that there's a vulnerability, but not necessarily give all the details right off the bat so it's an easy fix? I mean, it, is that the way there's an uh, adversarial relationship and you, there's a possibility you won't get paid, then yeah, I probably would agree with you there. Yeah. I don't know, considering I get paid, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not better. No, maybe you, gave, maybe you gave too many details. Uh, maybe I did, and then you <laughs> just walked in and said, oh, was, that should be false and not true, change that, and it was fixed. I don't yeah, know. It's so like, oh, we, we already knew about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I did, actually, that was the report. I, the, part of the reply was, I think we're following a similar bug reported by somebody else. And then I thought, oh, well, that means I didn't get paid. Yeah. I don't know if that's true or not. But but I, didn't, I, I didn't report it for money. I reported it because it was a... Uh, an issue that somebody reported to me and s because of the Facebook security guide I had written and said, you know, I found this problem, you recommended using this thing, but it doesn't work. And I said, oh, really? And I tried it. Sure enough, it didn't work, uh, which opened a, another hole. And so I communicated that to Facebook and, and the, they indicated they had a report of something similar, but, you know. Well, and which is more responsible? Posting to Mark Zuckerberg's wall to get their attention or disclosing it publicly? Which one's more responsible? Uh, I would say posting to Mark Zuckerberg's wall. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Yeah, so. yeah, and I think it's the, like I said, I really think it's the embarrassment factor. Now, some of this is hearsay. I, I, you know, looking through some of the comments on Facebook, they said if you go to this researcher's wall itself. The, you know, the article mentions that he posted to Sarah Gooden's wall at the beginning, but it sounds like there were several steps he went through before he even escalated to that level. So I don't know. Really testing for yeah, purposes. Yeah, he kind of went through and he could not get the security research team to, under, you know, to, under, to, to see the bug. Now I understand they get a lot of bug requests all the time, and, and it might have just been a miscommunication. You know, they didn't really see it as a bug, but I think he was elevating it to say, no, no, it really is a bug. You know, here's how you can see it. Um, and in their own response to it, you know, I think they they mentioned, you know, miscommunication stuff. And that right there is the very thing that makes you think they should pay something, even if it's just a little. And say, you know what, a bug of this nature or whatever would normally result in a $1,000 payout. 
we, in, we, we don't like some of the tactics you took. We understand we hold a little bit of the blame for that as well, so let's split the difference and make it 500. And, and I think that probably makes everybody happy. You know, it, it helps save their image a little bit, but it also helps deter from other researchers who say, well, that's how I'm going to get their attention. I'm going to I know Mark Zuckerberg doesn't want everyone posting their security flaws to his wall, <laughs> but um, in this case, I think I don't think it was necessarily malicious intent. I think it was, hey, well, pay attention to me. I really do have a bug here. I know you get, you know, 99% that are false. This one is real. You need to pay attention. Maybe they can right. create a cat <laughs> specifically for posting to the wall uh, yeah. for security. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, some of the information provided in the, the Facebook security post uh, from Joe Sullivan, who's the chief security officer of Facebook, indicated that they are changing some of their communication techniques to make sure they clearly articulate uh, what they need to validate a bug. And they'll also update uh, the White Hat page for more information on how to submit. Yeah. So if you go there, I think it's facebook.com slash white hat. And if you go there, it, it's where you submit security related bugs. Just double check that real quick. But uh, yeah, that's it. And so if you go there, they're probably going to post a little bit more information about what they're looking for in terms of reports. Yeah, and, and I don't mean to imply that, ev that everyone out there who's finding bugs is looking for money. I don't even know if this researcher is necessarily looking for a lot of money. I think he was looking, you know, primarily I think it's about the, you know, getting the, getting the credit for, for being the one to uncover it. But as we mentioned previously, um, the whole reason for paying for these bounties is to make it, paying out of bounties to make it desirable for people to ethically report the bug to you instead of reporting it to someone who can use it against you. And in this case, it just baffles me a little bit that Facebook, you know, with all this attention, they're like, well, we're not going to pay out because, you know, you didn't follow steps one through ten, you skipped step, step two or whatever, right? Just don't think it's good business. I well, I think it was a communication problem in, yeah. a, lot, in a lot of cases. I mean, the, the person who, who had the bug was not, uh, had, had knew English, but not that well, and there could have been some communication issues between the the security team in him as well, and they may not have completely understood what he was talking about. So, I mean, that's that's the problem also. So, and they, they did acknowledge that as well, but some of their best reports come from people whose English isn't great. Actually, I, I believe Facebook said that it was more of providing details, that it wasn't a, a communication issue so much in the, you know, in the spoken, you know, in the spoken language, so much as not giving enough details about the bug for them to basically verify that it yeah. existed. That I think is how they're saying it was a communication issue. But again, they're saying, you know, they are taking some responsibility, saying, you know, we didn't understand. You know, did they not communicate back to him? To me, if they, you know, they communicate back, said, we're not seeing it. I mean, to me, it was the next logical step. Well, here, I'll put it on the CEO's wall. Do you see it now? <laughs> you know, can you hear me now? Oh, it's, it's there. <laughs> I'm just carrying it. Yes. <laughs> any, anything, any other comments about that? Do, do we think uh, Facebook's bug bounty program is sufficient? I mean, is it on the level of Google's and, and Microsoft's? And you know, that's hard to judge from our perspective. Um, I think they have, a, if you go to the White, House, White Hat site, there's lots of information on what they would like to see in a bug report, things that, that if there's a security issue with some of the things that are associated with Facebook, not, but not made by Facebook, that those are the reports they expect. There's discussion of what the minimum payout is, and they have a page where they thank all the researchers who submitted stuff. So I think it's pretty good. And yeah. the other thing is, does it, does it need to be as good? I mean, they provide a social networking site versus Google that provides well, they provide email, web they browser. They provide that and a and social and networking and site, too. Well, they <laughs> do, but they provide a lot of other <laughs> things as well. Yeah. Yeah. So and it's the same for Microsoft. They also provide a social networking site, yes. technically, and, and they provide a lot of other services as well. So. well yeah, I think for a social media site, they, they've paid out over a million dollars. Um, According to this, uh, their, their feedback they provide on this. So I, I think they are, I mean, they're at least putting up some money towards it. Now, my real question is you said there's a page thanking all the researchers. 
they didn't pay this guy, but are they going to put his name on that wall? Yeah, ideally they would. I but, would think so. Yeah, I would think so. At least put his name on the wall. I mean, he did contribute. I mean, a, a bug in Facebook may allow you to a breach in privacy or whatever, um, but a, a, a flaw in your browser can compromise your computer. So. Yeah, but some people are using Facebook for a lot of other sites where they use it for their authentication. So That's I mean, true. they're they're it, it does expand a little bit beyond just the, the social media realm. But a lot of other popular sites let you log in with Facebook. So if there were a vulnerability in that, it really could spread out further. That's true. That is. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you to Mike Hill and Keith Watson. I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.